Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. I'm one of the two co-hosts, Michael Branville, and as always, I'm joined by Jay Gilbert. And just as a heads up, because we're recording this after we recorded our interview, I'm going to kind of disappear during the middle of the interview because my <laughs> internet connection sucks. <laughs> but you're there. You're lurking. I'm there. I was there. I was listening. I was listening the whole time. It was a great conversation. Um, before we get rolling here, of course, we want to just uh, say thank you to Bruce and everybody at HypeBot.com for everything you do to thank spread you, the word. Bands in town, thank you so much. And uh, DiscMakers.com, thank you for your continued sponsorship. We know it's a digital world, but there's still an important role for physical media for today's independent musician. Digital royalty payments are so small that selling products like CD, vinyl, and t-shirts has become such an important income generator. And you can't stress that enough right now when touring is, for all intents and purposes, done for this year. Right. Um, you need to be selling that physical, those physical goods online, wherever you can. Start selling physical goods. For every CD you sell, you might need roughly 3,000 streams to make the same amount of money. And that's a lot of streams. Our friends at Disc Makers are the place to go for your discs and other physical media, including vinyl, USB drives, and even t-shirts. So we worked out a cool little offer for all of our listeners out there. Head over to discmakers.com, place an order for a hundred or more CDs, and when you check out, use the promo code FREEBIZ, F-R-E-E-B-I-Z, all one word, FREEBIZ, and you will save up to $150 in shipping costs. And that's a nice little chunk of money that yeah. you turn around and reinvest in buying some more product. Um, so head over to discmakers.com, put that purchase in, use the promo code FREEBIZ, and save some money on shipping. Yep. So, Jay, great guest this week. Yeah, we have a publicist uh, on board, uh, Amanda Kagan. She runs ABC PR. She's worked with a, a lot of great artists that you know and love, and she's going to kind of demystify things about uh, publicists today. So watch it all the way through. Today we're pleased to have Amanda Kagan as a guest on uh, Music Biz Weekly. Uh, Amanda is a publicist. She runs her own publicity firm, ABC uh, Public Relations. Her clients have included Styx, Don Felder, Night Ranger, Poison, Ario Speedwagon, Tom Kiefer, and many, many others. Amanda, welcome to our little show. Thanks for having me, guys. It's How a pleasure are you, dear? to be here. I'm great. I'm really great. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. So for those that don't know, this may sound a little pedantic, but what, what does a publicist do? A publicist gets exposure for artists. Um, they, they get people in newspapers and on television and on websites in an effort to let people know that a product is out there. Whether it's a record, a full record, an EP, a video, just a song. Um, but it's our job to make sure that people know that there is product out there. Sounds like a big job. It's a, it's a very large job that's constantly changing. And you have to have your finger on the pulse of every kind of outlet that there is and there are always new ones coming to the table you have to constantly be aware of the changing of the staff at various outlets so there is a lot involved as far as logistics but then trying to be creative at the same time you have to have that balance it's it could be definitely tough sometimes are there things that artists can do to help you out for, for more success? Are there things that they can prepare ahead of time? Are, are there kind of best practices? I'm sure you have some clients that are just super easy to work with and they give you everything that you need and others that are kind of challenging. How, how can an artist work best with you? Well, that's, that's a loaded question, Jay. That's a loaded question. Um, you know, everybody is different. I mean, I've worked with, you know, Various people from Alanis Morissette, Tom Petty, 
I am I when I was still an assistant, I was working with the artist formerly known as Prince at the time. Um, he was the first one to make a CD ROM. I don't know if remember you guys that. remember that. Yeah. Which I actually still have. Um, amazing. So I've run the gamut from those big names and I've worked a lot of smaller names, but even in between, it's a matter of the artist being available and interested in doing press and um, sometimes having the sense of humor to do certain things. Like when you see Adele doing the tonight show, as an example, the fact that she could do that and do all of these crazy things with Jimmy because she just has a good air about her mm -hmm. and she has the sense of humor that I think adds to the love of from the publicist of doing the job because if they're willing to do these things that you put on the table for them, then it turns out great for everybody, especially if it's a situation like Adele, <clears throat> excuse me, on the tonight show where she does these great things and then it goes viral and then that's a whole other story. But, you know, for, for me, it's just about making yourself available and um, being upbeat and positive and wanting to talk about your product, even though you're asked the same questions over and over and over again, mm -hmm. um, because that definitely gets tedious. And I understand that for the artist, but it kind of com comes along with the territory. So unless you have the career like Taylor Swift, where you could have the ability to do one interview for an entire campaign and that's it, then, you know, then you are going to have to a answer, well, how'd you get your name? And, and what makes this album different from other albums? It kind of comes with the territory. So I like to work with artists that have the right attitude about having to deal with those kind of things. And um, for me, that's really, that's really what it is. If the artist is willing to work and go through those motions, then it makes me want to work harder for them. And if there are artists that I work with that don't want to do anything, then that's okay too. We figure out, we figure out ways around it and it's just, they'll do certain things depending on what the situation is, but not everything. So gotcha. it, it runs the gamut. Yeah. Gotcha. So how do you know when you need a publicist? Let's say you're, you're an artist. Um, you're in a non-COVID world. Maybe you're playing shows. You're increasing your base. You're starting to get some sales, streams, downloads. Do you, how do you know when you need a, a publicist? That's a very good question. Um, for, for a smaller band, I would say that if you feel like you're getting to a level where you're starting to get more, um, more love from fans, you're getting the kind of bigger out, you're getting the bigger venues, you're kind of making a name for yourself in your local hometown. And if you've already reached out to the local weekly or the local newspaper, and you know, if you've already gone that route yourself, but if you have a good story, especially, um, that helps. And if you feel like you've kind of, um, if you're reaching that level where you're, you've, you've exited your mom's garage <laughs> and, um, or your high school auditorium and you're, you know, and you're making a name for yourself in your local town and, uh, and you feel like you're at that next level, um, and you want to, and you think that you're in a way where you're getting the bigger crowds, you know, like you've moved up from maybe playing in front of your friends and family, but now you're playing in front of, you could actually draw a crowd of like a few hundred people and you're ready to release music. For me, I, I, I prefer to work with artists that are work, releasing music, um, especially with younger artists, because it's all about, you know, like I said before, the album the song or the video. So if yeah. you have something like that to release and you have some resemblance of a team lined up, whether it, you know, you figured out a way to use TuneCore or you figured out a way to get it 
onto iTunes yourself or on Spotify yourself, then, then yeah, you could call and we could work out a plan and it's basically starting from the ground up. But I think that you have to develop some sort of a base first. It's not, we formed a band, we're playing in our mom's garage, but we're doing all these backyard parties. So now we need a publicist to tell, to pitch Rolling Stone. Right. (laughs) Amanda, one of the things Jay and I have always said is, you know, when when you're out pitching yourself, Mm -hmm. and and a lot of artists don't like to hear this, your music is is the last thing people care about. That's not your story that you've got a brand new CD out, unless you are like the Rolling Stones or U2 and and you've got millions of people around the world waiting. That's correct. but for the most part, you know, just saying I've got a new c- CD isn't enough to get any sort of press. That's exactly you've got to have correct. a you've got to have a story. Yes, a narrative. Yes. Yeah, and there's there's one example that always comes to mind um, when I think about that kind of thing is um, when I was working with the band Egypt Central back in 2011. And they're an active rock band, and, and they did have a song on, on Octane, on Sirius XM. And it was, you know, it was a big hit. They were getting a lot of airplays. They were starting to chart. And um, they did have a good fan base, and they did have a good base of press people that already knew about them and just wanted to talk to them just because they had a new record out. But I wanted to get them more than that. And one, one day I was reading an interview that, that the lead singer had done, and he talked about how he was homeless for a while, and he used to play poker because he was a big poker guy in order to make money for himself. Wow. And also he, was, he kind of bounced around to different orphanages and things like that. So I was, that just kind of was a light bulb in my head, and I thought, well, that's the story. So I immediately changed up my pitch and I started using those stories. And I went to um, Bluff Magazine, which was around at the time. Unfortunately, it's not anymore. It was a huge poker magazine, uh, a print magazine. And I went to them and I, you know, I told them they're having this chart success, but they also have the story of the lead singer And he wound up getting a feature in the magazine. And even when the band was on tour, more newspapers and more weeklies wanted to talk to him because he had this story. Even if he talked about it over and over again to the Boston Globe or to the Idaho Statesman, it was the first time their readers were reading it. So it made them interesting. So I... There are times when I wish that I had more of that to play with in my job because um, even though when I start with an artist and I'll say, you know, if you have any kind of backstory, that's good to know because that will help with my pitches rather than we got together in high school and and here we are five years later and, you know, it, it that could be tough. It's like yeah. you said, Michael, it's not, it's not only about the music. I mean, even if you, even if, if there is music and there is a chart position or they have 50,000 plays on Spotify, it doesn't make a difference to the bigger outlets that we're trying to pitch and we're trying to secure coverage in. You need a story to, to get that kind of press. Well, always- let me, let me ask you. So, where where we are right now with the covid crisis mm-hmm. you know i i've been chatting with with musicians and some potential clients and you know they're like well my story is we're now locked at home and we're doing streaming and i'm like that's not a story anymore no it's not that might have been a story 3 months ago when this first started yeah but now everybody's doing it so mm-hmm. it doesn't yeah. matter that you are doing it how what what can what can artists do because, you know, there, there's a lot of talk that touring isn't coming back at all this year and it'll start coming back next year. You know, you're going to have the rest of this year to keep yourself busy. What kind of stories can artists come up with? Um, well, I mean, that's, that's an interesting point. And, yes, that's, that's very true. 
true. Um, that's not that's not all of it, and uh, it's it, artists just have to be. They have to just get smart about themselves and just look deep and figure out if. Maybe there are things they've never talked about before, but now is the time to to kind of bring that out of out of themselves. Um, I mean, and not to mention the fact every artist has to be has to have some sort of humility and know that there are plenty of bands that are going through the same thing that they are with this quarantine and stuff, but. You have to figure out a way to kind of be the phoenix rising from the ashes and make make more of the situation and do something to make your career more interesting to people. Um, you know, maybe, maybe while we were, you know, we were, we didn't have time to, you know, get together and write music. We couldn't get together, all of that stuff. But we went out and we went to the missions and we were serving food to people or, you know, just kind of create some kind of a story for yourself yeah. and create interest for yourself and not just be, oh, okay, well, here we are on Instagram Live for the millionth time. Yeah. You know, um, so it's you have all of this downtime and, and, you know, we talk about this all the time with, you know, Jay and I've talked about it. I've talked about it with my PR colleagues that these, these guys and girls just have to kind of figure out what to do with their downtime. They're, you know, they can't just sit around and just practice their guitars for the millionth time. They have to, they have to get busy on their social media. They have to, um, you know, go out and volunteer and create that story for themselves. Um, yeah. It's, do, it's, do, do, you, do you personally feel that during the crisis right now, it's a good time to still continue to release music? I personally think so. Um, I think so because people just need, they need a distraction. Music is the perfect distraction. I mean, I know for me, I can't, I can't work without, music on in my office every single day um, or be in my car without music. So even though people, you know, well, people are starting to drive around a lot more, let's be honest. So, you know, there's a need for it. Yeah. And I think that the mentality of, well, we don't want to release music because we can't be on tour to, sum- to support it. Okay. Well, I get that because touring is how, bands make money but it's i think that it's taking away from fans if you if you're lucky enough to have a big fan base and you're making fans wait for music then i think that that's for me that would be upsetting to me you know yeah um but I, i think that it's a necessary distraction and i don't think that there's any reason why people shouldn't be there's there's still ways to do it Yeah. You know, you and I have talked about this and you've heard me say this on calls. It's an always on music business now, right? So people are releasing tracks, they're releasing EPs, they're releasing albums. It's, it's changing, it's evolving, but Mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about how is it for you to go to press outlets with a track versus an EP versus an album with or without a tour? What's that like? It's, you know, it's interesting. Um, that's been, it, it has been a bit of a struggle to kind of figure out how to change my thought process of, okay, well, here's the full record or here's a full EP. I mean, right now um, I'm working with, I'm working with uh, Dozot St. Marie and they just released one song with an incredible video. It's called, where were you? Go check it out. And, <laughs> But the thing about them is they have a great story. First of all, the song and the video kind of, in my mind, speak for themselves, speaks for itself. Yeah. But um, they, have, they have a great story. They've been around in various incarnations. Um, Heather St. Marie is a breast cancer survivor. 
And the video kind of speaks for itself because it shows images of things that have happened in the past and it asks, where were you? So it makes you think as well. So instead of pitching it as an EP, a song coming from an EP that's going to be released in two months, it's just, no, this is it. And so I've changed it from, you know, pitching a, a, a magazine as a whole with a whole piece of product to one song. So I'm saying, well, what if you did an interview for the website and you also did a performance that they, you could post on your website and maybe even your social media pages and spread the word that way. Yeah. Um, because they're not on the road right now, I've also started pitching local TV outlets nationwide to try and get them a Skype or Zoom appearances to promote the song. And for like Good Day Austin, they performed Where Were You just in their living room. They recorded it and I sent it off to the TV show and it's going to air next week. Yeah. So it's, it's having to kind of, Kind of rejigger your mind yeah and are, yeah are yeah. there press outlets that say to you look I, I can't i can't deal with just the track i i need come back to me when the album comes out do people do that with you or not there, there are <clears throat> there me. are there are certain outlets that do that or you just don't get a response Nice. which usually indicates that, well, A, they're not interested or they're just waiting in the wings and they don't want to, they don't, they just don't have the time to tell you, check back with us when there's an EP. But I, I do feel like it is a little bit of a detriment. Um, so it's not like we're being bombarded with requests, but I think that there's a good chunk of people that will give them the time of day and will want to support a band because of its story, because of the song, because of the video. And I mean, I'm getting ready to work with another, another rock band and it's just a video campaign. Yeah. It's, it's not in connection with a forthcoming EP. It's just, this is a band that has a really good fan base. They have a, a nice chunk of followers on Facebook and they have the money. So I agreed to work with them and it'll probably only be a month's worth of work, but it's still something and it's getting the video out there and trying to get it planted on websites and trying to get interviews to go with it. And I'll yeah. be doing the same thing with them. You know, if, if they're all together and they have the ability to record a performance, then I could pitch that to TV shows, especially in their hometown as I did with, with those on what kind of expectations can a new client have of a publicist and a couple specifics that i hear all the time are will will you guarantee me coverage can you guarantee that i'm going to get in this newspaper in this magazine on that website and secondly are you going to send me all of your contacts that you sent my material to so i can see who you solicited um well yeah I get that a lot. You do? get that a lot. <laughs> yeah. What um, do you say? I, I mean, you know, expectations have to be managed all the time, whether you're working with a younger artist or a bigger name artist, especially for young artists. Um, I would say that they just have to have patience. And, you know, rollingstone.com is, is not going to, come knocking on our door right away. It takes a lot of work. Um, it takes a lot of work on all of our parts. And, and the hope is that all of that stuff will come eventually. But in the beginning, we just have to work from the ground up and we just have to be patient. Um, so, I have to manage expectations a lot in that regard. It's, that if hard? an artist, if, it's, it's very difficult. And frankly, it's, it's, it's mentally draining for me because if a younger artist that has no business being on NPR or on rollingstone.com and yet they say those two those words in an email to me, the red that flag. kind of makes me not want to work with them because I could already, I could already feel my, the tension 
rising in my blood that yeah. it's like these people are just they're not they don't they just don't know and it's my job to tell them right. so i try and manage it and i try and tell them you know things take time i mean look at billy eilish or i mean frankly even lo- like when i worked with maroon five and nickelback um you know those were both when i worked with them they were both still up and comers in a way I mean, Maroon 5 had established themselves as Cars Flowers, but when they came out as Maroon 5, nobody cared about them yet. So I had to, you know, I had to kind of remind people of who they were. And I was the one who sent out their first CD for Songs About Jane, all 500 pieces standing in a cubicle. (laughs) And then it was the matter of just educating people and... You know, things for them didn't explode until they got on the radio. And that happens with, you know, that's the thing about a lot of bands. And the same thing happened with Nickelback. I was able to get them some some nice features. And I even got them like a nice photo shoot and a feature in Guitar One magazine when that magazine was still around. But as soon as How You Remind Me hit the radio airwaves and it started charting, they bumped it to a cover. So it's... You know, and and with Billie Eilish, you know, yeah, she was lucky enough to get certain things. Like she she got Vanity Fair because she's an interesting artist and she's doing something different. That's the other thing. Yeah, it's that she sounds. She really does sound like not like anybody that I've ever heard before. Sure. And editors glommed on to that. They recognize that. And so, if you're lucky enough to be an artist like Billie Eilish, who's so original. Mm-hmm. that Vanity Fair comes calling and says, well, we, we want to follow you, you know, every year for the next five years because we believe in you, then, you know, yeah. then that's the luck of the draw. It's yeah. not always going to happen, but in the meantime, just be grateful of what you're getting. Yeah, and there's other elements there, the kind of anti-body shaming and, you know, uh, same with Lizzo. There are some things yeah. that I think, whether it's a cause, whether it's, you know, something that you believe in. I, I'm a big believer in that narrative. You know, I yes. want to know what's interesting about this artist, not that they just have a new release coming out. And I think that's that's a challenge for you and the artist. Yeah. But but you, you said something that made me think of, like, what are the kind of the do's and don'ts? Because we've all seen these artists who maybe they make a political statement that they shouldn't have made and it polarizes their crowd or maybe they do something uh, Mm -hmm. that's offensive. I mean, I I would imagine some of what you do is a little bit of damage control, right? Yeah. um, I had a situation a couple of years ago when um, I was working with the tenors and um, one of the, one of the members who's no longer in the group, Um, he did something at the all-star baseball game and it it immediately turned into a crisis management situation. And, um, and that was an interesting time to be in because I hadn't been in a situation like that in a long time, but it really, but we had a lot of meetings and we decided of, and they're from Canada so it was going to be one interview in Canada, one interview in the United States. And then it was a matter of deciding who that interview was going to be with. And was this interview kind of clean up? It uh, was clean up. It was basically the, the other three members going on camera and basically apologizing on this band member's behalf. Right. And, and it was a lot of, it was a lot of kind of mea culpa and we didn't know that he was going to do it. And we apologize. This isn't what we believe in all of that kind of stuff. So that was very interesting to be a part of. And it was a very stressful 24 hours, I bet. but then you do it and then you just kind of lay low. And then it's my job to be, you know, telling everybody else, no, they've done this one interview they've released one statement. If you want to know what it is, if you want to run it, please refer to the statement and they could do that over and over. That way you kind of manage the message 
so to speak, because we've all seen those things. Yeah. You know, I mean, John Lennon, you know, saying that the the Beatles are more popular than Jesus. The next thing mm-hmm. you know, they're burning their records. Mm-hmm. I sometimes wonder if it's not all about the message, but how quickly you get, you control that message. You know what I mean? Yes. Like if someone says something or does something offensive in any way, I think, tell me what you think, but it seems like the longer you wait, the more damage there there's going to be. It's, it's better to get out in front of it, mm-hmm. get your statement out there and then stick to your guns. Is that? Yeah. I think so. I think that that's the right way to do it. And frankly, these days with social media, there's, it's, it's, it's the easiest time in history to be able to do something like that. Um, If you're called out on it, then a celebrity just goes on Twitter and they do their mea culpa and their apology there. And then that's just, you know, and then it's up to the public to decide how they want to move forward. And eventually some people do. I mean, there are plenty of celebrities that have done really bad things and yet we're all loving them again. I, I, I won't name any names, but you know, that kind of thing happens. But these days there's no excuse not to do it right away. And it's interesting because I was, I was watching the American president, the movie um, the other day. I know it well. And it was the same kind of a thing where, you know, he just, People are asking him about Sidney Wade and he's not commenting about it and everybody's being driven nuts about it. And then finally he comments and it all is just, it is what it is, but he took too long to comment yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. but these days with social media, it's, it's too easy. It's too easy not to. Yeah. So how can an artist kind of, you know, begin working with you do once you agree that this is a right fit do you help them with their bio and their press release do you want them to come to you with that do you like to play a part in that collaborative role how does that typically work i if an artist has already written their bio then i'll just go through it and i'll maybe tweak it and i'll suggest that they add certain things whether it's a quote or more information about their history. Um, Otherwise, um, I usually like to hire writers to write bios because they're better at describing the, you know, the grand music scale and how they use guitars and their songwriting and stuff being that kind of flowery. Yeah. Um, So I'll help them. I'll help them hook that up. And then from there, I write the, kickoff press release which announces an album a tour a song a video and i take information from the bio um and then i'm just off to the races and just starting to pitch people and and uh and doing my work but yeah if an artist can if an artist has a bio already written then that's aces and and i appreciate the the information that i can just run with and i don't have to wait for it yeah. But if I have to help an artist along with that at the beginning of a campaign, then, then yeah, that's, that comes with the territory. Um, yeah. I always like artists to come ready with photos. That was um, my next question. I, mean, I was going to ask you, how, yeah. how, you, you know it's important to me, but how important are photos to you? I think it's really important because you want to have interesting photos. You don't want to just have an artist... I mean, if an artist is standing in front of a brick wall, then, all right, I mean, you know, it's a nice picture and everybody looks handsome and everybody looks pretty, but there's nothing special about it um, unless, you know, even if you're posing certain ways. So I like landscapes and I like, you know, funky backgrounds and, and cool poses, even if there's an artist that's kind of like got his you know, kind of like that when the rest of the guys, you could see their full face. I like that kind of a thing. Yeah. I like the arty kind of pictures, but I think it's important because it goes with the, your image. Can if that you, help if it's you? Just, I if think you, that if it helps If you've got a me. bio and a press release and you're talking to outlets, can that help you kind of land things if you have compelling images and the, they look interesting? I, the, the reason I ask is I feel like sometimes people are lazy and they don't want to read through things, but if visually they can connect right away, 
I don't yep. know. Well, that's, I mean, and, and a video goes with that. I mean, I think that a photo definitely helps. Um, I think that if you have something striking rather than just guys up against a, a brick wall um, and something where you're just scrolling through a website or turning the pages of a magazine, then yes, it, you want to create something that people are going to be like, whoa, that was, what did my eye just miss? You know? So I think that's very important. And I think that's what will draw people to, oh, well, the photo looks cool. Let me read more about it. Yeah, but yeah. I, photos are extremely important. What, what do you love about And not job? to mention the fact, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I no, was go just going to say that, and most importantly, the artist has to be happy with the photos yeah. that are chosen by their team because I've worked plenty of campaigns where it'll be, oh, this coverage is really great, but I really hate that photo. Yeah. And yeah, why then did you that tell us for that? me, <laughs> yes. And then that kind of is like a want want for me yeah. because then that is like, oh, I was so excited to get this for you, but yeah. then you hate it because. Of the yeah, no, that's a really good point. I, I was yeah. just asking, like, what's what's the what's the best part of your job? Well, I'm I'm a music nerd from when I was a kid. I didn't want to do anything else but be in the music business, and. Um, so I still get a thrill of hearing an amazing new song. I mean, I'll never forget the first time I heard Break It Down Again by Tears for Fears or, you know, a new PM Dawn song or any of the songs that I was lucky enough. When I first heard Uninvited by Alanis Morissette, I lost it. I was crying. Um, so I'm, I'm a music nerd. And when I hear good music, you know, when I first heard the Licorice Quartet, when I first heard Lighthouse Spaceship, like my mind was blown and I like getting that feeling yeah. working with, with musicians. Um, and I've always, I always felt like I had this special bond with musicians because I grew up with musicians. You know, my dad was a conductor and a composer and my grandfather played the bassoon at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York. So I've grown up with it. So it's in my blood already. And so it's a combination of loving the music that I work and then getting to see my client perform on stage or online, even if it's just online these days, yeah. I still get a thrill and I get, and I have pride in that. You yeah. know, when I see, when I'm at a sticks show and I'm seeing an arena full or an amphitheater full crowd, you know, just kind of jamming along and having such a good time. It just, it just fills my heart, you know, it, yeah. I have real joy in it and the stress that comes along with doing my job. It's a job like anything else. Yeah. You know, I've worked with, I've worked with some bad people and uh, you know, I've gotten through that and that's the bummer of the job, but it's a job just like anything else. It just happens to be in a creative space. Yeah. And, um, but it, it really is, I really do love doing it and I'm glad that I kind of stumbled into it in the beginning of my career. I didn't, I didn't study public relations. I learned from the best from Mitch Schneider and he taught me everything I know. And I just wound up loving it so much because we were doing something in the music business that was so, that was something that I had never really paid attention to, but it was yeah. so interesting to learn how it all worked and to be a part of that. And so to see, you know, when I was working with the Backstreet Boys, when their Millennium album came out and I was the one that was tasked with putting their big press conference in New York at Studio 54 together and being a part of it and just putting it together and doing so much work and all of that stuff. Like when the press conference started, I cried. Yeah. I was so overwhelmed that it was like, oh my God, look at, look at what's happening. And I had yeah. a hand in this. And yeah. so I love those feelings and it, and they continue to happen to this day. Yeah. Well, publicity is one of those things that when you're in the industry, you realize mm -hmm. how important it is to launching careers and releases and managing uh, the brand and that yes. narrative. But for those kind of on the outside, they, they don't really 
maybe give a lot of thought to, well, how did that artist end up on Jimmy Kimmel? How yes. did that artist get that feature in the LA Times or CBS Sunday Morning or NPR? It just It's one of those things you're just like, oh, well, there's James Taylor on CBS Sunday Morning. That was a cool yes. little feature. You know, that's really neat. But then, you know, what you do, you kind of see how the sausage is made. Those, yes. I would imagine it's you have relationships with these outlets. Mm -hmm. You get them the things that they need. You coach your artists on what they need to do to make themselves interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I was talking to a friend of mine who at the time was a writer for the Huffington Post. And he mm -hmm. said, you know, these, these managers and artists make my job so hard. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, they come to me with, okay, we've got this album coming out and we need, you know, we need this covered. Well, what's the narrative? Why should anybody yes. care about this album? That's great that you have a new album coming out. And that, yeah. that, that really, I'd never heard anybody say that to me in that way before. Yes. So now with kind of everything that we do, we kind of ask the question, why should anybody care? You know, mm -hmm. is it aspirational? Is it like mm -hmm. Dozat St. Marie? Have you ever overcome adversity? Are you making yeah. great music? You know, all of those different things. So anyway, yes. um, before we, we let you go, where, where can people find you online and where can they learn more about, you know, ABC and, and all of the things that you do? Um, well, um, I have my website is abc-pr.com and I'm on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Um, Facebook and Instagram is ABC Public Relations Twitter is Amanda ABC PR, and I'm always keeping those updated with clips that I'm getting for people. Um, Twitter tends to be a little bit more on the personal side. It's a combination of both. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I'm I I post clips on there. I mean, if people want to read press my press releases to see how I put those together, those are on my website and usually on my Facebook page. Um. So yeah, I mean, that's how people can find me and it's constantly updated every single day as, as stuff comes in. I'm not, I, I mean, I, I post a lot of stuff and I'm not like one of those people that's like, oh, okay, I posted something at one, I should wait until three. Like, no, if I posted something at one, <laughs> but something new comes in at 110, I'm posting it. Gotcha. Because it's, it's also for me to use as a new business tool, Sure. you know, so I want people you know, at a label or management company or an agency to look at what I'm doing for my clients. So yeah. it's a promo tool for me, but that's how people can find me. And they could learn about press releases and, and how bios are written and what cool photos look like. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Amanda, you and I could talk all day and we sometimes do. Um, but thanks so much for uh, joining us and we'd love to have you on uh, again we had a little bit of uh, some connection problems today but uh, we would we would love to continue our conversation another time too I I would love that I mean there's certainly more stuff that we could be chatting about yeah. so I would love that I would love all right that. well stay safe and thanks again for joining us we really appreciate it thanks guys you too thank you Discmakers.com. Use code FREEBIZ for ground shipping on CD orders of 100 units or more, $150 value. First, let me just apologize to all of our viewers and listeners. I was, I was there for the whole interview, but my internet kept cutting in and out like every couple minutes. There's, there's a power outage somewhere in town here that's affecting a bunch of, bunch of the city. And I have no idea what that means to the internet connection because maybe the Comcast hub or whatever it is, is losing its power too. So anyway, Jay, you, you did a fantastic job running this show by yourself. I just <laughs> sat back and enjoyed listening to Amanda. Well, thank you. And, you know, look, Amanda is uh, a friend. She is a publicist for a lot of my artists. I've known her for a long time. Um, her twin sister um, works with us, uh, Emily. And I, I really wanted to have the conversation because there's so much mystery surrounding what a 
publicist does and you know managing expectations and all of that so you know we can also continue this conversation there's so many areas that we haven't even touched on but it's it's super interesting to see you know what goes on with a publicist yeah it it definitely is yeah i i get so many young clients coming in that you know like i brought up about the expectations they just don't know what they should be expecting what yeah. should be done what you know why why even just the simple well what do i need a publicist for anyway yeah what do they do why am i going to spend all that money on a publicist yeah. and you know it's it's a constant educational process i've found yeah yep um so before we wrap up this week let's just do a quick uh shout out to our great supporters and sponsors Bruce over at HypeBot.com, BandsInTown.com, thank you so much. And, of course, DiscMakers.com, thank you for your continued sponsorship of the yep. Music Biz Weekly podcast. And uh, if you're watching or listening on YouTube, hit that red subscribe button. Spotify, hit the follow button. iTunes, subscribe, leave us a review and a rating. It all means so much to us. Appreciate it. And, uh that's it. We'll see everybody next episode. All right, a little silence, and then we'll do the opening. Let me get my notes up here. And we're still recording. Yep, good.